we have to tell you, or I have to tell you, that we have no plan for this conversation. It seems to me that when you've got a good photographer and good pictures to discuss, that's easy enough to get going. Um, very simply put, I mean, the reason you're here is that Miles is one of the most distinguished fashion and commercial photographers in the country. And that in a thing like an art fair, where there's a tendency for people from one side of the great rifts of photography to snub people from the other side, it's always quite a nice idea to have people like myself to do the talking who don't do any of that snubbing. Very, very briefly, I'm, well, I'm called a professor in the culture of photography at the University of Brighton. I'm basically a long, long-standing critic and historian of photography on one side, and on the other side, I've also been a commercial person. I started the biggest stock photographic library in Britain. I started the first online gallery of photographs, iStorm. So I'm a generalist, if you like. Miles is a specialist, and that will be where we get started. I thought I'd ask you just to get us going, yep. to show us some pictures so that, A, we all talk about the same imagery when we get going, and B, because it's easier for me to watch some pictures and yeah. have, have you explain <laughs> where they start, and that'll give us a launch pad to, to get us going. chance to think of some of the questions. Yeah, that's yeah, fine. Yeah, great. So, um, the first image is, um, it's called 3D, and it was commissioned for uh, the New Yorker magazine. Um, all of my work is commissioned work, actually, which is something to talk about later. Um, and I'm often asked if I have sort of personal work outside of the commissioned work, and I, I, I mean, I, I sort of do, but what, what I really feel is that the commissioned work is the personal work, mm -hmm. in as much as that all one's uh, feelings about the world and uh, oneself, the sort of autobiography of oneself, should appear in, in the commissioned work. That's why, uh, in a way, the New Yorker or, or Vogue Italia is asking me to do a picture, is they want my sense of the world and the culture at that point in the picture. Well, let's, let's stop you right there, because there's stuff there. Stuff to talk about there? There's a lot of stuff there. <laughs> One of which is obvious, which goes, that's all very well when you're you, but mm. when you're a baby you, when you're a young mm. photographer, mm -hmm. what is it that they want? I mean, my understanding of these things is that the less power you have as a photographer, the more you have to do what you're told. Mm -hmm. You managed to have a thing where you kept your voice going. And yep. At a very, very early stage, it was your style, your manner, your way of thinking yep. that they were buying into. Tell us why. T tell us what happened that meant that people could hang on to your way of thinking yeah. rather than getting you to illustrate some storyboard. That they a lot of photographers are simply doing what they're told now. A lot of photographers' clients are present at the, at the shoot, and a lot of the work is done to the client's immediate request. That's not so much how it works yeah, for you. I, I, um, <clears throat> I mean, I, I quickly realised that uh, in order to sort of have a, a meaningful career as a fashion photographer, that you really did need to have a point of view quite quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, I quite... I mean, I, I um, you know, as a baby, uh, me, as it were, uh, I was pretty much um, like a lot of my contemporaries. I was working in sort of the, uh, I was working in the sort of the language of grunge photography, which meant um, flat daylight, uh, no hair and makeup, and the model was quite ordinary looking. It was a sort of celebration of the real, in inverted commas. Yeah, but it was a very odd generation in Britain, that. I mean, it was you, a, it you was were a member of a group of yeah. people who, to the great <laughs> surprise of people in Italy and France and the United States, mm. made it possible for that very high-gloss fashion world to suddenly look at the street. Yeah. And we know, I mean, some of it is very obvious, some of it is, if you like, the rise of Kate Moss, but yep. I think in terms of names of your rough contemporaries, one thinks Corinne Day, one thinks David Sims, one thinks Jürgen. Yep. These are people who didn't do what fashion photography was supposed to do yep. as a group. And what's odd is that it happened to everybody all at once. Yeah. It may be that that has to do with that London thing of... London is supposed to be a place where fashion takes place more on the street and people wear less of a uniform. I'm mm -hmm. sure that's true. Mm -hmm. But in photography, it also works, I think, the other way, is that you and that lovely gang of photographers were able to insist through the face and ID and mm -hmm. those magazines that actually there was a way of presenting the world that wasn't slick. I think it was very like the, the YBAs, yep. in as much as it was just sort of conviction and a commitment to uh, a new a new way of seeing in a, uh, if, 
you get, you get me, uh, supported by the magazines, and it was very exciting, but it only lasted, I think, probably 12 months, mm -hmm. two seasons. Uh, so I, I slipped into photography kind of as a bluffer that way, um, but I quickly realized that if I carried that on, I would be completely um, forgotten about and didn't have, wouldn't, would just be kind of a sort of a, a footnote in the history of grunge photography, because I wasn't Jurgen or Craig or David or Corin, who were much more sort of hardcore. I would sort of describe myself happily as a sort of grunge light photographer, L-I-T-E. The name, um, I suppose one has to say the name that lurks in the background of all this that you haven't mentioned is Nigel Shaffron. Yes, yes. Who was sufficiently committed to that. I'm not sure I like this word, grunge. Shaffron was a naturalistic photographer. Yeah. He was a person who wanted to talk about how things affected him, and he's gone on to do that. And as he's stayed with his vision, isn't he? Yeah. He has, yeah. and he still does commercial work, but he does much more of that personal yeah. work yeah. that probably he couldn't sell to the magazines. And that seems to me the kind of pressure that you were under at the beginning of the thing, is what? how far can you push that personal vision without it being unsellable to people? I, I think the main thing I would take away from that period of my career as a baby me was how incredibly exciting it was. Yeah. It was, I mean, um, it was very like the, mo the movie Blow Up in as much as it was suddenly not swinging 60s London, but it was swinging 90s London mm. and magazines and models and photographers were very sexy. And it was great to be part of that. But as I, as I said, I, I, I quickly found that I couldn't I couldn't get a, a handle on how to give those images an identity. Mm -hmm. And because I had a background in illustration, I, I was slightly frustrated by grunge in, the, in as much as that it was a completely nihilistic vision, in as much as everything was a no. So no background, no set, no props, no hair, no makeup, no beauty, etc. cetera. This, and, you gather, this is somebody who likes props, all those hair, things. background, makeup, yeah. beauty. Yeah, yeah. And I would sometimes be at the Face magazine and propose a picture that was with a prop, like a, you know, something, a motorcycle flying through broken glass, I remember, and it was completely laughed, laughed upon as if this was sort of so decadent. And uh -huh. I guess it was like, um, you know, I was Baroque in my approach. I wanted lots of things in the pictures. Um, but anyway, I, frustrated by not being able to do these photographs, I started to draw these pictures and bring them to the photo shoot to uh, almost as a kind of a map of what we were going to do. And by having this plan or plot or design about the, uh, the image, it actually gave me an immense amount of power over everyone else in the studio because mm -hmm. most of the people in the studio had no idea, you know, uh, in the proper grunge way, had no real idea of what they wanted to do. They just wanted to turn up and um, do nothing in a way. Like the, the end result was to do nothing, and that, that would be the great that corresponds of to things that had been happening a bit before mm. in music. It yeah. certainly corresponds to things in, in performance poetry and those kinds of. It's not an accident that these things all happen at once. Although I'm suspicious of the word zeitgeist, there's no doubt that London yeah. has a way of infecting people across one art form to another, yeah. where certain ideas become quite standard. Can I hit the button? Sure. Just, just oh, to, hello. <laughs> there we go. Um, Talk about that. So. Yeah, so then cut to this. Um, I was now a photographer uh, who was thinking more like a filmmaker about images and the, how a set of images could work together rather like a series of images in a movie um, to tell stories or at least kind of bring you into the idea of storytelling. And, uh, you know, and of course, at this point, the whole sort of grunge negativity has, has vanished from, from, my, from my work. And I'm very determined to not do accidental pictures and actually do pictures that are incredibly controlled. Mm -hmm. um, again, driven by these drawings. So this picture, there's a drawing for it. Um, and uh, it does, to all intents and purpose, purposes, look like this photograph. Um, a lot of my heroes are directors, Hitchcock being one of them. And Hitchcock always said that um, after he'd written the script, he found the actual process of filming incredibly boring yeah. because it was sort of plod ploddy, you know, and workmanlike. Uh, I disagree, although I, there's elements of that I agree with it in as much as that once I've figured out the picture, it's now a technical process of making the picture. But unlike Hitchcock and being bored with it, I'm actually fascinated by the minutiae of those details, such as when I set this picture up and put the transparent underwear on the model, realized that she had no hair um, 
down there. And it kind of... Um, might have to wait a while to reshoot. We could wait, reshoot. we could reshoot. <laughs> we tried to plan to reshoot in six weeks. But, um, no, the simpler thing was to speak to the hairdresser on set and say, could he do anything? And um, he, he very cunningly, well, it's a bad word to use, and it's uh, that's <laughs> cleverly, um, came up, he got a wig and he trimmed the ends of this wig and he very carefully positioned his hair in the underwear and um, See, we took I, the picture. What I find fascinating about that is not that the hairdresser can do that, mm. but that the hairdresser is a he. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we're, we're close to it. Of course this is a picture which is absolutely overladen with gender issues. And right, that little missing S on the word he in the hairdresser mm. seems to me interesting about mm, the industry mm, that you work mm, in. Yeah, sure. Where a lot of the thing is actually sold as being for women to look good, to women to feel good, but mm. it's so mediated men. through these men yes. in all sorts of positions. Um, is it too early in our conversation to ask you about this? Is it too early to ask you about whether you do think the industry has certain obligations to a kind of responsibility in society to deal with gender issues, with race issues, with mm. money issues? Or is it isolated enough that you don't look at that side of the world as you uh, do your stuff? I live in a world where images of women are rampant, of course. Mm. Um, and I'm quite, you know, those, that is the, uh, the consumerist culture that I'm part of and, and live in. I don't think it's right or my place um, to... I'm not really interested in, in passing comment on, on that as if to say that I find that bad or, or I certainly don't, wouldn't say that I find it good. But it's, I, I don't think art, and, and I consider my work art, I don't think art's purpose is to <laughs> criticise and comment on the world. Rather, I always think it's much more interesting that it's reflecting the world. Mm -hmm. And so if the world is, has issues of racism or sexism, et cetera, et cetera, those must be in the work. Um, we're not doing a kind of Nazi propaganda job where we agree that every image has um, a, a happy mother with two children. No, 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 no. I mean, without, without mm. uh, accusing you of anything so mm. big, clearly, I mean, over my lifetime, there have been numerous occasions where mm. the fashion industry has been accused, rightly or wrongly, oh, yeah. of neglecting certain aspects of life, of mm. overemphasizing certain others. I think of, uh, you know, heroin chic, I think of two mm. skinny models, I think of the misrepresentation of, re and, you know, sure. these things come in waves. Um, I, I, I always see it more like rock and roll. I, I kind of feel that, that these fashion photographers are, are, are more like rock and roll stars and less like politicians, mm -hmm. meaning that they are responding emotionally and gutturally about the, the world that yeah. they're in, and they're not sort of um, not very good. It's a bit like Bob Geldof trying to save Africa. You know, w w rock stars not very good at that. No. Uh, in the end, it's a bit kind of, of a, as a bit of a misdirected energy. I think um, and Bob Geldof wasn't very good at music anyway. Let me go just back one stage of that argument, yeah. and then, then we'll leave it happily, which is my view is that you don't become a photographer unless you want to communicate certain things, that it's a communication business, it's a business. And mm. I've argued for years and years, I mean, I, I base my activity on the idea that photography is capable of as sophisticated and as complex messaging mm -hmm. as filmmaking or writing pop songs or writing novels. And there's something about the way photography is still treated as marginal, mm -hmm. which gets in the way of the appreciation of the fantastic subtlety and sophistication of the messaging yep. that you can put in. If that's so, then you can't just be a rock star and mm. say, well, there are problems of, as I say, gender or whatever sure. it may be. At some point, you have to be actually telling us what you think. And we know that you do, because your photographs are so visibly yours. Yep. You're a person who's built a style of photography mm -hmm. where from 100 yards and with one eye blindfolded, I can tell one of your Good. pictures. That's not true of many photographers. Sure. Somewhere in there, there's got to be an intellectual stance. Yep. as well. I, mean, I hear people saying, the style of a photographer is always identified by a technical you know, mm -hmm. It's got a ring flash, it must be Nick Knight. It's sure. got a white curve background in the 60s and a white tie, uh, a black tie, white shirt, black suit, must be David Bailey. And I yep. always resisted that. My mm. view is that the intellectual position of a photographer 
comes through their work just as much as... With the technique, yes, of course. Yeah, I think the two things are entwined. I mean, with me, my technique has always been about precision and clarity and seeing. I mean, I don't see the world with elements in focus and out of focus. Mm -hmm. I experience the world, everything's in focus from the camera back there filming me to, to you. And so if I'm going to do a photograph about this moment, everything's in focus, which is quite tricky to do with a camera because mm -hmm. cameras are designed to only have one point in focus. So that's, that's a kind of an example of how I think technique <coughs> and, and sort of theory or ethos or principles about how you experience the world, they kind of come together, if that makes okay. sense. Okay. You said half a moment ago you talked about art. You quite legitimately say you think your art is your work. You don't, everything you do is commissioned, you said. Mm -hmm. um, it's an odd kind of art which depends for its distribution on the needs of certain kinds of clients. Mm -hmm. Now, Apart from the Renaissance, of course. It's yeah, but, but, that, but yeah. well, sure. But yeah. th then the artist is saying less of his own and more of the clients, and that's always been understood. Well, I, I think that's. A, I think the, the example of the Renaissance is is a, is, a, is really a good analogy for me. And as much as that, of course, you know, Michelangelo's um, ceiling at uh, St Peter's is about the creation. Mm -hmm. But if you look closely, it's about homosexuality and many other things too, and everything that he was really interested in. Yeah. And there's, there's images in there that were clearly desperate to come out of him, you know, and it is a personal vision, mm -hmm. but commissioned by a pope. Um, and my pope is, you know, Franco Sozzani of mm -hmm. Vogue Italia. So they are all commissioned. I, I, to me, the commission is really eight or 10 or 12 blank pages. What do you want to do with it, you know? I, I always go to these meetings with these people with drawings, and um, it's, it's always about, a woman, uh, uh, and they then are able to kind of interpret those drawings and say, great, well, we'll, we'll incorporate that with coloured handbags or something like that. Uh, and I think what's successful is that when people look at the work, that they don't really feel that they're looking at handbags and dresses mm -hmm. and skirts and, mm -hmm. and shoes and things. Um, and that was, you know, I mean, as, as a young me, as an art student at St. Martin's, as an illustrator, I would go to the photographer's bookshop and, and sort of pour through these books of Avedon, not knowing that later I would also be a photographer. Should we have a two-second moment for Claire de Rouen, who helped us all in those days? Oh, she, did she run that one? Claire's bookshop yeah. was the yeah. place where lots of young photographers, she died not that long ago, mm. um, much, much of a loss to well, she, Did she run the photographer's bookshop? No, photographer's no. Gallery. she oh, ran the photographer's gallery one. bookshop before she ran her own. Did she? Ah, she did. I didn't know that, okay. Great. And I mean, almost everybody in this room would have bought something from one of one of the other yeah, at, yeah. At, at some point. Sorry, that's a footnote, but no, one great. has to pay Good respect one. where respect is due. But I suppose what I'm getting at is that you know I was a young art student who was interested in everything you're meant to be interested in, like Egon Schiele, Picasso, blah blah blah. But actually, I found myself looking at these fashion photos, but certainly not because I was interested in fashion. Mm -hmm. I was interested in the kind of the narrative that Avedon or Helmut Newton was proposing. And if it was Irving Penn, it was less a narrative. It was more a fascination of how a glass of water could be so fascinating as a photograph with nothing in it. I know? love the idea that Penn was always referred to at Vogue as Mr. Penn. He's the only one. Yeah. The, the executives at Vogue were called Mr. and Mr. Penn for 50 years or whatever yeah. it was. Yeah. He, you know, nobody called him Irving. That wasn't yeah. acceptable. Irv. <laughs> <laughs> well, that wasn't acceptable. Keep going, because yeah. li life is short. And we have, and they, uh, we, I said we'd start with the big well, yeah. If you're happy, I'm happy to go through yes, yeah, yeah. in this kind of order. Um, I wanted to get to a Polaroid. I know you've got this terrific show. Does everybody know that there's a show of Miles' Polaroids away from this fair in German Street? I have to be a, a Can spoiler. Can I call it a pop-up show? Well, you can. It was a pop-down show because oh, it just finished yesterday. Sorry. <laughs> it is simply fantastic because what you Thank have, you. you work in Polaroids in the way that you're talking about the drawings. That the, the, they, they get yeah. cut up, they get drawn on, they yeah. get squished and squashed. But what you see is an artist. In these things, you see the end of a thought process. Whereas in the Polaroids, you see the thought process. Yes. Have you got one? I yeah, know, they go uh, forward, you'll find can some I, Polaroids. Can I keep yeah. going? And we can always come back, can't we? There you go. There's one. So that's exactly, that explains, there's a can there's and one. there's some cherries. And there's some wood. <laughs> uh, these things are tiny. The, I mean, I'm sorry you can't see it if you haven't seen it. They were hung in a room which is designed for old master paintings. 
So there was this absolutely beautiful, massive brass picture rail yeah. to deal with those ton and a half frames. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then these little things from... It was know, a nice contrast, wasn't the, it? The yeah. small, it was a brilliant show. <laughs> Thank and you. actually, Thank for you. me, as a, as a critic, it, it's, it's often in the work that photographers do before mm. the finished one mm -hmm. that one gets to see the thinking sure. that one does. You've used Polaroids all your career? Yes, because I shoot on film, and that's crucial as part, for me, anyway, for someone who's so obsessed about precision. I mean, the Polaroid is a very simple um, device that will give you a clue to how the final picture might be. You said to me the other day something which I thought was interesting, which is that most photographers use the Polaroid to check the lighting, yep. and you don't, mm -hmm. because you think the lighting's going to be right already. Mm -hmm. You're using the Polaroid before that process to check that the ideas convey what the ideas are meant to convey. True. I yeah, thought that yeah, yeah. was interesting. Yeah, but they're like the a watercolour sketch by Constable, if you, you don't mind a sort of pretentious analogy. It's to see if it works, really. You know, I mean, every photographer is also a consumer of images, and so you need to be able to look Sorry. at it. Why did that die? Oh, uh, what do we do? It died just at it the... It didn't come back when it happened yesterday, and we're doing it. Did it? Oh. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. I've taken control. Look at that. Seems to me that's a lot more interesting than the same thing finished, partly well, because of the surface. That's from the same series as the, the, the pitch we saw earlier with the hand on the, on the, the, in, the inner thigh. And it was really nice looking, at, looking through these Polaroids, and I'm glad you like them so much. Um, I, I was really... It's hard to convey what I'm trying to say, but being somebody who's so controlling about the picture in the first place, so started with a drawing, establishing where the camera goes, where the lights go, positioning everyone, you know, making a, 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 a merkin if it's needed, whatever, all these things. Um, so then look at the Polaroids, which are filled with accidents, such as that, the one that was just up there. Sorry, I don't um, know what that's about, but... It, it was very exciting to see that the accidental can actually be really a tur turn on in, uh, for me. Um, I'm excited. And that's, that's and sort of a new I know uh, that you've got a revelation. book of the Polaroids out at the moment, and I, I, I just think there's something about somebody like you who's built a career on control. Yes, exactly. To suddenly see that actually there's a lot of... Accidental. Well, yeah, but accidental has communication built into it too. Mm, mm. It's not just accidental and some of them make nice patterns. Yeah. Is that actually quite a lot of your attitude... I mean, I, am I allowed to name drop in these things? I did a thing the other day with David Beckham for a charity, a charity. <laughs> and Beckham much stood next drop. to me all the time doing, doing this to his wrist. He stood, because all the time when he's in front of a camera, he's got something to advertise. Mm. So he, he's lifting up his cuff the whole time and he's, he'll, he'll be talking to you like yeah. this and he'll just be fiddling with his glasses because somebody's going to use the picture for money Gosh, because he's life. just shifted his, or his wrist yeah. or the, the, the brand of his shirt. And you suddenly notice that yeah. all of his gestures are like that. That wouldn't have been Organized. a successful yeah. picture if the wristwatch had been hidden by sure, the cuff. Sure. But in the Polaroid, it yeah. doesn't always quite work yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. And I quite like these tensions between obvious commercial loyalty to your sure. paymasters. Yep. But at the same time, the story doesn't necessarily need that. And no. That, those balances seem to me worth, worth thinking about. Yeah. Worth, worth, yeah, yeah, yeah. Worth something. I mean, because I'm inspired and influenced a lot by uh, pop art, all, all, all sort of forms of it, whether it's Liechtenstein or Warhol, um, you know, the, the idea of the, of the object or the product as being the star of the picture is quite fine for me. Yeah. You know, it was a big brass, you know, showy watch. That's great. You know, it's sort of, that's an aspirational object that I can meditate on and think there's something <coughs> sort of sinister about that, the power, the, the, somebody who wastes their time and money on an object like that creates a character that I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. they're, not just, um, they're not just things that I'm reluctantly showing. I'm happy to show them. Slow down a bit for somebody like myself who's not in the industry at all. Mm. Are you allowed to be cynical yeah. about the clash between your motives and your clients' motives, or even the motives of your readers, your, your buyers, your audience? How does that work? I mean, I'm sure you don't approve of every product that you help to sell. Mm. Does mm. that disapproving <laughs> sometimes help to give the picture an edge or to give it some sharpness or to give it some point which it might not have had if it were, yeah. you know, if well, you were I a solid servant of the, of the sure. game? Sure. I mean, probably, 
uh, probably a very simple way to explain this is, if, is to imagine that every model that's wearing a dress or holding some toothpaste probably doesn't particularly want that dress or like that use that toothpaste or cat food or whatever it is they're selling, you know. Yeah. So, you know, we're all in an industry of, of selling dreams, which I'm sort of, that comes with, that comes with the territory. Um, but uh, I think because my main patron is Vogue Italia, Franco Sozzani is very aware that great brands like Miu Miu and Prada and... and it's all right, they, you don't have to mention them. <laughs> the, uh, they, they're not just selling, they're not just, I mean, the women, they're, the women uh, particularly, they sell to men too, of course, but the, the people they're trying to approach aren't just interested in pretty colour things. They're all also interested in saying they have a very deep intellectual life and that they know the references that this, this overcoat looks like somebody in a, in a, in a mic. Michelangelo Antonioni film, for example, and if you wear that overcoat, it means that you know the film, therefore you're, you're, you're culturally aware. So there's things like that that go on. So, but we're all entitled to be cynical about that process. I mean, yeah, sure. When they make an advertisement that tells you that it looks like an Antonioni overcoat, mm. and then you know that it looks like an Antonioni, you haven't actually gone very far in no. your cultural no. um, skiing. Yeah. You, ha you haven't slid down the mountain very far. I mean, I, as you gather, I'm capable of being very cynical about mm, that stuff. Mm. But I also think it's an industry which has actually subsidised a huge amount of photographic activity over the years. It's, sure. not, it's not just you. I mean, um, at its worst, commercial photography is awful, and mm -hmm. at its best, it's very, very fine communication. Mm -hmm. And I feel the same about news photography, and I feel mm. the same about theatre photography, and I feel the same about sports photography. Mm -hmm. Somewhere in here, one has to talk about standards. And you sound like you've found one. I'm interested you use the word patron, that you found one person mm. whose standards you're prepared to aspire to. No doubt there well, are I others think, whose standards you well, aren't, as, as it were. Again, going back to the Michelangelo and the Pope, I think it's a, the situation is more than, in as much as that they give you enough rope to hang yourself. Mm. So they are happy to give you these blank pages to fill with colour and women and product. Um, but... If you go, if you take too much, I mean, it depends on, if your universe is too dark and you, and you show that in the pictures, then they may not book you again. So you're as good as your last job, you know, you're freelance, uh, and that is the sort of the situation. I'm, you know, endlessly fascinated by making images. I, I do really make them for myself to see if they will. Talk to us a little work. bit yep. about the confraternity of photography. Are you, pals with those people you said were your contemporaries in the grunge period? Are you mm. desperate rivals for a job against people that you... Do you socialise with photographers? Do you share some kind mm. of even self-improvement thing where you might sit on planes together mm. um, worrying about how imagery works? Or mm. are you a loner? No. Are you, um, are oh, you I'm certainly a, a, a loner. I mean, I think... Uh, I'm, I, I mean, I'm, you know, very happy to... Uh, say hi to these people. Sure. But <laughs> we don't really talk much. Right. Um, the, uh, I mean, when I began photography, the actual whole idea of what kind of film you shot on and wh how you processed um, your film was top secret. Yeah. And so uh, this was something you would never share with another photographer. Um, I'm still very much that way of thinking, and that's not just to do with my chemical processing, it's to do with, I don't know, you, you have to be very, um, you have to be very private, I think. As an, I, mean, I don't think that's just as a photographer, I think that's as an artist. Uh, I mean, of course, there are great examples of artists sharing ideas like Braque and Picasso, but on the whole, I think artists are quite Yeah, but at the solitary. same time, we, we also hear that there's a kind like of writing. there's something called the fashion world, which is rather oh, yeah. a family and where people are supposed to get on and the great circus moves on from one place to another. You've been part of that in your time and you must get some sustenance from a group of like-minded people who I wouldn't say so. I mean, the idea of Stephen Meisel being <laughs> wonderfully uh, generous to any other photographer <laughs> is quite hysterical. Um, no, it's much more mean-spirited industry than that and I think they're most of your contemporaries would rather see you fail 
<laughs> that's a that's a harsh thing. I'm going to ask just one more question because I'm aware that we're running out of time. But mm. that explain mm. a little bit how the thinking goes. Okay, great. Again, yes, I've come please. I've come back to the I've come back to the Polaroids because yeah. they're my thing. But it clearly, I mean, you're working with lots of different things at once. Yeah. Like, yeah. We haven't got much time if we I'll want to fast. take some questions. Okay. Talk me through it. I love that thing. Well. I some people might know this picture in another way as the final picture, but the final picture is the fork with the spaghetti with a, a red mouth, lips, red lipstick mouth, kind of gorging on this, this spaghetti, and that's the picture. But this is the Polaroid uh, working towards making that picture. So we needed to black out the girl's face around the mouth uh, because I just wanted the lips floating in space. Um, but here in the Polaroid, you see beyond that to see her flesh, which is quite interesting. And the spaghetti was rather kind of disgusting. First of all, it was stone cold. Um, <laughs> but we had to paint it to get the right colour. <laughs> so it doesn't actually look like... In, in my imagination, it looks like that when it comes out of a can. Yeah. But in reality, it doesn't. So yes. we had to mix it up with paints and food dyes and things and get the colour right. And this poor model had to sit there with her mouth open while we experimented with different shapes and twirls of spaghetti. I photographed her with orange lipstick and thought the orange lipstick and the, the spaghetti colored orange would be an interesting kind of melange and it would really work, but it didn't. And I couldn't differentiate from the lips to the spaghetti. And so in this Polaroid, I've grabbed a pair of scissors, cut her lips out, and then behind it, I would have floated sheets of colored paper, red, purple, so forth, to see what I thought, uh, as an artist, would make the best composition and blocking of colors. It ended up being red. So I've then put this Polaroid in a box, forgotten about it for, I don't know, 18 years, mm -hmm. found it and thought, what is this about? Yeah. You know? um, and that's why I like it. Me too. Yeah. But w what I think is interesting is I suspect that now the book is out, you're coming back to finding these have maybe got a bit more mm. of you in them. Yes. And a bit less of that. Control. Um, other people can ask lots of questions sure. too. Miles, thank you very much for explaining a little bit of your processes of of thought to us. Mm. Uh, go ahead, don't Pleasure. be shy. Thank there are you. always questions in these things, but they always hesitate. There's a moment when nobody... Go ahead. <laughs> We've got a microphone so that, please, once you've, once you've got a question to ask, <laughs> wait until the microphone comes to you. I see absolutely no hand raised. <laughs> Has timidity overtaken my audience? <laughs> go ahead. Oh, There's right. a hand over there. Do, do wait a second. Thank you. To know why you're still using film for your photographs. That's a good question. Yeah. It, it may not be apparent uh, to everyone, but to me, it is apparent that uh, possibly because I enlarge my prints quite big, but um, I really, from the beginning, have always seen a difference between digital photography and film. I mean, I began on film, of course, because my career is about 20 years old. Um, but when digital came along, a lot of my contemporaries were very keen to jump on it. I think that there's many good reasons why it's useful, because you, know, you get instant gratification is probably the main reason. Um, I tried it, and I didn't know where... I couldn't see where the colours had gone, and it seemed very, very flat. And then, of course, you put it into Photoshop, and you can bring the colours back up. And to all intents and purposes, it looks rather like film, but not, when it's enlarged, it's still not quite got that that sort of pizzazz of film. But my main problem with it is that I don't want to then go back retrospectively and add the colour. I like the fact that the colour is occurring chemically through the process and that when I photograph um, Francis, his red socks look fantastic without me having to but they turn them up. With, they clash with yours. Yeah, mine look better. Yours, yours are better. <laughs> more turned up. That's more why Photoshop. That's why you're in that chat. <laughs> but I don't know if that makes sense. So I like I like the fact that the colour is coming from almost the history of colour photography is this sort of I don't even know what the chemicals are, but the colours are reacting to the light, and then the the chemicals on the film are reacting to the chemicals in the in the bath, and everything is kind of exploding, and you always get I still get this, a shock of seeing the film when it comes back from the laboratory. It's like, wow, those socks are really red. He you could know. have answered you in one word. He, he could have said, I'm a conservative. <laughs> Somebody else, thank you, go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, the question I ask is, uh, looking at this Polaroid in particular, there's some kind of an influence of uh, perhaps the earliest days when you were at St. Martin's and looking 
uh, a little bit at Mr. Penn's work mm -hmm. and so on. And, Very true. And, or Hero, for example, mm -hmm. it has that kind of extraordinary impact, even with the cutouts and, and, and mm. so on. Who are your heroes or heroines today in terms mm. of further inspiration beyond classics and art, in terms of the photographic practice? Who would you look at as saying, ah, oh, mm. what's going on there? Good question. Gosh. Well, I mean, when, uh, it's not really today, but maybe 10 years ago, but when Gregory Crudson came on the scene, I was quite knocked out by the rigor and brilliance of his work. Um, sort of cinematic conceits in there. I thought he'd really done something brilliant with photography to make photography really feel like movies in a big print. Um, that's the only name that really springs to mind. Uh, I mean, a lot of my heroes are still my heroes, and there would be that sort of trilogy of Newton, Penn, and Avedon, really. It doesn't change much. Do you look at a lot of magazines? Do you keep yourself up to date, as it were? Do you, do you look I at what the rivals know. are doing? Do you, do you kind of look at a lot of magazines when you've got time just to make sure you know what's going on around you? I don't. I th and the first thing I do when I check into a hotel is put all the magazines in the bin. Yeah. I don't like visual junk around right. me. Right. I find it just distracting. So the, the latest copy of interview and everything goes straight in the bin. And, uh, probably so you're very uncomfortable in, in an art fair. You, you find you wander around like this. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's exhausting. It's, it's it is exhausting. It's slightly it depressing, is, yeah. I must say. Seeing so many pictures, you wonder how you fit into it all. Well, not to say that they're good or bad, but just that it's like the sea of imagery. Yeah. Um, is a problem You feel you drown in it a little bit, you know. Let's take a couple more questions. Have you got time for two more, one more? Just one more. Thank you. I see. I'm sorry. I saw a hand first. All of, they've all come from over there. I must be blind in one eye or something. <laughs> Go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, I'm wondering if you have a personal practice outside of what is commissioned, if you sort of take photos for yourself and not for... Well, he, we talked a bit about he that. Answer, he answered yeah. that already, so we'll take oh. another question. Okay. Cause <laughs> he, he started right at the beginning by saying he regarded his commercial work as being his personal practice. I won't let you answer it because we've no. got so little time. Let's we'll, do it. We'll take a, somebody else. Go ahead. Um, sorry, I just wanted to ask, when you were starting out in your career, because you're so interested in having control, was it difficult finding a team, like stylist, makeup? Well, um, I, what, what helped me get control was the drawings. So I had the same team. I was very lucky. I don't know why, but I was very lucky. I had a brilliant team from the beginning. My, I, mean, I talked about Stephen Mizell earlier, but my first team when I went to New York was Stephen's team for some reason, and I, it's a mystery to me still quite how that happened. But um, so I always worked with very, very good people, and I was very lucky with that. Uh, but they would always, I always feel, felt like I, the, the shoot was running away. I had no control over it. And uh, there would be this, this period when the hair and makeup was being done, and I had this terrible anxiety thinking, God, it's my turn soon, I'm gonna have to take a picture, you know, on this white background. And I would be kind of reading the New York Times and drinking my cappuccino and, and feeling sick to my gut that I was having to kind of get up soon and do something. And I, I think over time, that feeling of not knowing what I was doing, I literally did not know what, what I was about to do. <laughs> um, it was just exhausting. And so I started to do these drawings. And, and, I, and then I would talk to these people. And of course, you know, the, as I said, they would typically, the hairdresser had an idea, the makeup artist had sure. an idea. They all like, sure. did all their stuff. And then the girl was ready, and now I'll take a picture. Um, very kind of like blow up, if you want me. And then I, because they're so talented, you know, I was, I was, I was coming with a drawing of a couple making love in a car, and that would spark an idea from one another, and it started a conversation. Yeah. But um, I think typically a fashion shoot doesn't need a photographer if it has all the other people there. Somebody else could do the picture. But are you, in fact, very loyal? Do you have the same team that I you work with loyal. again and again? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, and it's not so much loyal that I'm a lovely person. It's more that I, it's better to... To work with the people you know. Work with people you know, and you don't have to have this conversation about, you know, let's do it like this and not like that, and let's not waste time and um, going in, down the wrong route. You know, with new, with new people, you, you know, with new people, you're very nervous that they, they don't know your work or they won't know kind of what you want to do. So it's kind of a shorthand by keeping the team the this, same. Thank you. Time, time is our problem since you're no, talking about it. No, it's gone fast, isn't it? We could go all afternoon, but thank you very much, Miles Aldridge, for thank explaining. You. Thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.